Hey everyone, my name is Mason Egger, and today we're going to be standing up a Jupyter Hub server on Ubuntu 18.04 with HTTPS. So you may be asking, why do I need this? Well, having a Jupyter Hub of your own is a great way to have a multi-user version of Notebook that you know you can use for your company or for your classrooms. If you want to use this for your company, you can remove the overhead of having all of your developers install Anaconda or set up their own environments and such. You can just provide them with a developer environment. Or if you're using this in a classroom and a research lab, you can ensure that all of your students are creating and building on the same and unified platform. Also, you can ensure that they're only using the packages that you want them to be using. So as you can see, there are a lot of use cases for using a Jupyter Hub, and this video is going to show you exactly how to do this. To do this, we're going to use the littlest Jupyter Hub. This is a installation that is provided to us by the Jupyter Hub project that allows us to create a really small Jupyter Hub server, uh, removing a lot of the complexity of standing one up for, you know, anywhere from one to a hundred users. You know, if you need more than that, you have a couple of options. You could either spin up multiple Jupyter Hub servers and use those. Uh, you know, divvy up your users between the servers, or they do have a larger uh, zero to Kubernetes Jupyter Hub. A system that you could use also to spin up and scale to the thousands of levels and such. Um, today we are going to be doing this on DigitalOcean. So as you can see, we're on the DigitalOcean account. I am a developer advocate for DigitalOcean. So we're going to spin up a Jupyter Hub server uh, using this. Um, one of the prerequisites that I would recommend you have, especially if you want to use the HTTPS and TLS feature, is that it would be wise to have a domain purchased and either know how to add DNS records to your domain or have it managed through DigitalOcean and add them through there as you're going to see me do. So without further ado, let's go ahead and create our droplet. So we come over here to droplets and we're going to go ahead and pick Ubuntu 18.04. Currently the littlest Jupyter Hub uh, only supports Ubuntu 18.04 and it only supports a version of Python that is 3.5 or higher. Luckily Ubuntu 18.04 I believe ships with 3.6 so we should be fine on the Python side. Um, go A standard one is totally fine. If you do need more CPU optimized or memory optimized because you think that you're going to be needing more resources for your students uh, or your coworkers or whoever you're spinning this up for, Feel free to go ahead and do that. This is a great project for, you know, sharing work with your coworkers or also using this as a classroom teaching tool. So for this demo, we're going to go ahead and choose the $20 a month, uh, four gigabytes and two CPUs with 80 gigs of solid state storage. I think that's more than enough to do with what we need. Um, whenever you start figuring out how much your users are going to need, keep these numbers in mind. The Jupyter Hub runs at 128 megabytes of RAM overhead. It requires roughly 20% of the CPU and it requires two gigabytes of disk space. So if you're going to have say a hundred users and you think they're all going to be running on it at the same time, well then, you know, it's likely you might need a hundred cores, but that's probably not true. And in reality, I don't even think you really would need a hundred cores. I think that they'll probably share some. Um, so, you know, and most of their code probably isn't going to be maxing out a CPU core. So I really wouldn't worry about it that much. I believe that probably for a hundred, you know, if you were doing a hundred student classroom, I imagine that you probably wouldn't see any issues running on this $40 a month. I, heck, it, depending on what kind of code you are use, running, you'd probably be totally fine running here on the four gigabyte and two CPU. If you're doing like teaching Python and stuff. Now, if you're doing some heavier data science models and machine learning and all of that, hey, all bets are off and you're gonna have to figure that out on your own. The good thing is, is that if you do choose too small, you can easily upsize to a different model. Um, and just add resources to your droplet. It's no big deal on DigitalOcean. So don't worry about going too small. I would say aim small and resize up rather than you know pick a very large one and then not need it. And there's really not a good path to resize down. So uh, yeah, definitely pick small and go up. We're gonna do this in San Francisco. We're going to probably not select any of these options as of right now. Um, I have an SSH key set up, so we're going to go ahead and use my home desktop SSH key. We're going to give this a name so we're going to call it jupyter hub dash tutorial and then we're going to go ahead and create the droplet this should take you know about a minute maybe a minute and a half doesn't take too long could take even less honestly um it's one of the things i love the most about digitalocean is that the uh, allocation of machines is super quick and as you saw from that ui it's also very simple as well So we just sit in here waiting, it's going, it's going, it's trying really hard, it's thinking about it, and boom, we got it. 
So now we have our IP address, and one of the things we're going to do right away is we're just going to go ahead and add a DNS record for this. So I've been playing a lot of Pokemon lately, so we're going to call this Score Bunny, and we're going to go ahead and uh, go ahead and set it to that. And in case I mess up and I don't feel like waiting an hour on the TTL on my DNS record, we're going to go ahead and create a five-minute TTL on our DNS record. So now we have a a record for scorebunny.egger.codes and that directs to our server. So now once we set it up, we'll be able to easily go to the DNS name and find it. Also, this will help us with when we do our Let's Encrypt. So let's go ahead and go over and SSH into this machine. So we go ahead and SSH root, if I could spell, at scorebunny. I really hope that's how you spell his name too, because I'm he's who I'm currently training in Pokemon uh, Shield. I'm playing Pokemon Shield right now. Uh, yes, and we have a really long passphrase because I'm moderately paranoid. Hey, I got it right. I normally don't get it right the first time. It's really long. So we go ahead and clear and get that mess out the way. Now note for the sake of this demo, I'm going to be doing this as the root user. If you're going to be trying to do this in production or you're going to do this, uh, you know, in a classroom or somewhere else, I would recommend creating a user and then sudoing all of these commands instead of just running it. And what we're going to go ahead and do is we're going to download the bootstrap file from the internet. So I'm going to, this will be posted in the notes for this. And I missed the Y, so we're going to go ahead and add the Y. So there'll be some uh, notes for the directions on how to do this. And the, this is either going to be a link in the description or there will be a, just these notes will be in the description of the YouTube video. So we're going to go ahead and download this Python file uh, from here. And now we have. A really slow terminal and now we have Python or we have bootstrap.py so now we do Python 3 bootstrap.py and then this next part is super important whenever my terminal decides it wants to catch up you have to set your admin username here if you don't do this you won't have an admin at all that you can log in with and you'll basically have a server that nobody can do anything with there might be ways to add it but uh, this is the easiest way so let's go ahead and just do this so now we're going to go ahead and install this. This does take about five to 10 minutes. So we're going to fast forward the video here until the very end. And then you're just going to see it. Just know that when you're doing this on your machine, it does take anywhere from five to 10 minutes to get this. Okay, and now our server is up. So if we go to scorebunny.egger.codes, we will find that, hey, our Jupyter Hub server is up, but it's giving us a warning saying, hey, this is an HTTP connection, not an HTTPS. Any data you send over this is gonna be insecure and we don't want that. We definitely wanna make sure that we have our connection secure so that way our passwords aren't being linked across the internet in plain text. So what we're gonna go ahead and do is we're going to just set this up to actually work this way. So it's really easy. We can just use the tljh-config command, which is the littlest Jupyter Hub uh, command line tool to uh, configure your little Jupyter Hub. So we're going to set HTTPS uh, enabled to true. We're also going to set the HTTPS dot let's encrypt dot email to the email address that you want to. So this uh, allows us to use Let's Encrypt, which is a tool that gets us free SSL certificates. So that way we can use our uh, HTTPS. So now we do tljh-config, and we're gonna go ahead and add an item, which is https let's encrypt, I wish I could type, domains, and then score bunny dot egger.codes is going to be the domain that we're going to use to secure with our certificate. And that has uh, taken. So now what we do is we do a tljh-config show. Wow, I can't type. And as you can see, we have HTTPS enabled. We have set our email address and the domains that we want to use are set properly. So that is all great. So now what we're going to do is we are going to tljh-config reload the proxy. Okay, so now we're going to go ahead and give this a minute because now that we've reloaded the proxy, it's actually going to try and negotiate a uh, SSL certificate with Let's Encrypt. So this sometimes does take a little bit and we do sometimes get into a little weird state here in the middle 
where it'll say, hey, the certificate's not trusted and things like that. It does sometimes take a little bit. So if we go ahead and uh, refresh it, uh, my demo made a liar out of me because it's immediately worked and now our connection is secure. So now we used our admin, our admin user, which was Mason earlier. And what happens here is that we don't actually have a password set. The first password we log in with is the password that is actually used. Um, this is how Jupyter decided to do this. So basically once we sign in, it's going to create our password with what we put there. And as you can see, it went, and go, went right ahead and created uh, our uh, user for or our user and created a running server for us now. So as an admin, I can go here and if I did a Python 3 notebook, it will open up a Jupyter notebook for me. And if I do print hello Jupyter hub and we run it, it works. So that's great. We're going to go ahead and get out of this and leave. Yes, I don't feel like saving right now. It's totally fine. It's over here. I don't need it. We're going to go ahead and delete it. But the interesting thing is now that I'm an admin, now I can actually add people. So I can stop my server and, you know, do things on my server. Or I go over here to admin. And now, no, I don't know why Google Translate keeps thinking this is not in English or in a language that I can read. Um, we're going to go ahead and add users. And what we're going to do is we're going to create a new user called test. Um, and we're not going to make them an admin. We don't want them to be an admin. So we're going to go ahead and add this user. And they've never logged in. So now I can log out as this user, as the admin user. And now if I log in as test test, it's going to create a server for me. And boom, now I have test for myself. Test has his own uh, server and we can go ahead and do that. So now we're going to do one more thing. I'm going to log in one more time and I'm going to install some packages. Um, so now we can go to new and we go to the terminal. And now that we have an interactive terminal, I can install packages for, um, for all of the users. So the way that Jupyter Hub, this version works is that uh, only admin users can install packages. So if you were to go into your you know, Jupyter Notebook and do the exclamation mark pip install, blah, 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 blah. It would not work because the, uh, they have not been given permission to write into this common place where all the, uh, in this common environment where all of the uh, packages are stored. So if we want to do that, we have to do from here, sudo dash E conda install dash C and say, we're going to go ahead and install from conda forge. We're going to install NumPy. So it's going to go ahead and solve the environment for us. Oh, apparently it's going to install and do a whole lot. It's even going to upgrade by Python version. Okay, you get the idea. I'm not doing this right now. Good. I didn't. I was hoping that wasn't going to take too long. So also the same way, if you want to install something from pip, we can just pip sudo dash e pip install flask. I know that sudo and pip is making a lot of people that are very uh, familiar with Python and pip cringe on the inside. Um, this is what the Jupyter Hub tutorial says to do. If you have issues with it, don't, don't come at me, you know, go and talk with them. So the way that this is set up, this is the way that they want it done. So yeah that's how it's going to work so now if i log out and i log back in as the test user and we create a jupyter notebook of python 3 and i do an import flask which is not a typical thing you see inside of uh jupyter notebooks i think but i'm not sure if there's one thing I am not, it is not, a, I am not a data science. And I think that means that it runs, but I'm always never positive. So yes, that means that it was properly able to run it. If it didn't run, it probably would have exploded and said, hey, Flask isn't found. So as you can see, we were able to install a user server straight from there. A user package. I don't know why I said user server. That was a weird word to say. So we're going to go ahead and close this again. And... We don't need this anymore and we're going to go ahead and log out and that's how you set up a jupyter hub server step by step uh inside of DigitalOcean. now if you are uh not familiar with this level of systems administration or if you you know you just don't have you don't 
do SSH or want to do any of that stuff. Um, in the notes below, there will be a cloud init installation that you will be able to use. And I'm going to go over that real quick on the DigitalOcean side. So whenever we created our droplet, come on, Sammy. So whenever we created our droplet, we, so we, we intentionally left this section blank, this select additional options. User data allows us to put preceded data in there that will be run after the droplet is stood up. So one of the things we could do, and I'm going to copy and paste the code over from my uh, notes into here. This will also be in the notes, uh, is that we can do... We can precede this data with, uh, you know, the, all the commands we want to set all this up properly. Now, the thing is, is that when you do this, you're going to want to change your email address and you're going to want to change your domain before you hit this. But what this will do is it will spin up the server and the server will look like it's ready. The DigitalOcean thing will come up. You'll get an IP address, but it's going to be running this stuff in the background. So, um, and really the only good way to check from the browser side to see if it's done is to hit your DNS record and just see if it works and just keep refreshing. It does take 10 to 15 minutes, I will say. Um, so I would definitely recommend that if you do this, you know, give it some time. If it's, you know, give it, give it a handful of minutes and make sure that it is actually not working before you have to SSH in to view your droplet if you wanted. Um, but other than that, yes, this is the way you would do a cloud init data set. And it would just allow you to really quickly stand up all of this stuff without having to do SSH and do all of that. Um, I hope you enjoyed this tutorial and thank you for tuning in.